Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to see so many of you coming to talk about sustainability, which is a very, very important topic, increasingly important in sports. Um, collectively, we'll be trying to answer the question, when it comes to sustainability challenges, particularly around the environment, issues like climate change, is athletics on track? Um, of course, sustainability is a lot broader than just the environment. So our conversation today will touch on topics around environmental sustainability, social and economic sustainability as well. And fortunately, we've got a fantastic panel to help us unpick that question. Uh, to my far right is Christoph Joho, who is the co-meeting director of World Class at Zurich, who is organizing this Diamond League meeting. To my immediate right, Seb Ko, the president of World Athletics. To my immediate left is Ayla uh, Ayla Del Ponte, who is a Swiss sprinter, who was a gold medalist at the European Indoor Championships in 2021. And to my far left is Tiberio Daddy, an associate professor at the Institute of Management at the Santander School of Advanced Studies in Pisa. Um, my name is Matthew Campelli. I've been working at the intersection of sport and sustainability for a number of mm -hmm. years, uh, and I'll be guiding today's conversation. But please, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them throughout the session. I won't be doing five or 10 minutes at the end. If you have questions, put your hand up and we'll try and make this as interactive as possible. So let's start quite broad. I'm going to ask our panelists what they think about sustainability in a sporting context. Why is it important? Uh, Christoph, maybe we can start, start with you on that one. Actually, sport is really contributing, and our sport, to the sustainability. And as you mentioned at the very beginning, it's not only ecological sustainability, also the social sustainability is, a, is in, extremely important. And you see it with the United Nations sustainability goals. It's one part is about air and pollution, but there are many goals where the sport or athletics can tr contribute to society. What, what do you think, so picking up on Christos point, athletics contributing to society, environment, social issues. Uh, you know, why is it important to World Athletics? Can I pick up on your opening comment, which, and you posed the question, is athletics on track? And the question I would ask is, set that aside for a moment, because we can only be part of a larger uh, movement. I think the question we should be asking ourselves, is global society on track to do anything about this in a meaningful way? And the answer, I have to be blunt about it, is no. Because if you look at the, the declared intention of reducing you know, temperatures by one and a half degrees, that's still actually only going to maintain the status quo in 50 years' time. So it's not actually making a real real-time shift. And we're still pumping 51 billion tonnes of carbon emission into the atmosphere every year. So the challenge is massive. Can sport be a part of that? Yes. Is athletics wanting to be a part of that? Yes. And I think in a really practical way, both at, uh, at meeting director level and certainly what we're doing at World Athletics. But I don't... Look, you know, we sort of celebrated Clean Air Day yesterday and we have our own campaign, um, particularly aimed at elite and, and participation runners. We've got 1.4 billion runners that identify themselves as participation runners in the course of a year, and we've got our air quality monitoring units. And, but the reality of it is that we can only be part of a, of a larger global movement, but can we and should we be sitting at the table in sport helping direct that? Yes, and I think we can join that global conversation and make a, a profound difference. Ayla, what's your, what's your opinion on that? Why, why is sustainability increasingly important in sport? Yeah, to link to what has just been said, I think that as also sport movement, we can set an example and then bring other people to the discussion and make a difference in this way and uh, set an example of, look, this is what we're doing, uh, this is how we're doing it, and then just join in. And I think it's, uh, it's important that we do this. Tiberio? I would uh, mention uh, three reasons why uh, sustainability is important in sport. Also trying to get some information from uh, the research that we have carried out in our university. Uh, first, because uh, uh, the supporter expects it. 
Uh, two years ago, we have carried out a survey interviewing face-to-face -face, uh, 1,500 supporters of football, especially Swedish and Italian uh, supporters, and 81% of them, they say, I agree that uh, uh, football in that case, but sport in general, should look uh, to environmental sustainability as an issue uh, to tackle as other issue already taken uh, constantly, like uh, social issue, like racism uh, or accessibility and so on. The second reason, uh, again, uh, last year we have carried out uh, an environmental footprint calculation of a football match. Again, uh, we have uh, carried out especially research uh, in football sector. Uh, the question was, is uh, the impact, the environmental impact of a football match relevant uh, uh, from an environmental point of view or not? Because it's clear that if it's not relevant, why I should pursue uh, the improvement or however, my, if, my efforts uh, uh, will not be uh, so effective. And the results demonstrate that uh, uh, a football match uh, is uh, uh, really relevant uh, and uh, uh, aspects like mobility, energy consumption or food and beverage are very relevant, uh, has, has a very relevant environmental footprint. Third, I would say because uh, sport in environmental sustainability, according to my experience, uh, is a little bit a little bit in delay compared to other sectors like uh, manufacturing or also uh, other service sector, for example, uh, tourism. It's uh, 20 years that we are speaking about sustainable tourism, but uh, uh, is, uh, uh, let's say, six, seven, five years that we are speaking about environmental sustainability in sport. So the uh, attention is increasing a lot, and this is good, but uh, in somehow there is, uh, uh, let's say, this delay to be recovered. Before we, why, why is there this delay? What, what's, what's, what's the reasoning for this in your, in your, in your yeah, experience? Yeah, uh, we, we raised this question when uh, we discovered, let's say, uh, uh, this situation. The first question was probably because the environmental impact is not so high, the mm. first uh, uh, option that came in our mind, but we calculate the environmental footprint and this is uh, demonstrates that the, the, the environmental impact can, can be relevant. In my opinion, because, uh, even if, okay, I, I am uh, not uh, an expert of sport management, because uh, uh, in sport, uh, uh, the sustainability is, has been watched uh, always on social aspect uh, since uh, se several years uh, ago and uh, the environmental uh, pillar of sustainability has been watched uh, uh, till some years ago, uh, not uh, with uh, the, the attention that is watched now. So this is, this is good. D does everyone here agree that the sport should be doing more around the environment? Uh, well, let's read the room a little bit. You, I guess you're all sports fans, you're all interested in sport, I suppose. Who, who thinks sport should be doing more around the environment, and even social issues? Let me raise your... All right, that's pretty much right. everyone. Okay, good. Similar to the 81% we've, we've, of our we've, 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 got, we've got the right room. That's good, that's good. Uh, so, so, tell us a little bit about your, your, your vision for this. Obviously, you say sport is a small part of the wider picture, yeah. but so what is Wild Athletics doing to, um, to try and be part of it? Well, we're doing a lot, actually. Um, uh, look, Every Breath Counts is a really good example. Um, we came to the conclusion a few years ago that if we're not about clean air, then we're probably not about much else. You know, other sports have focused on oceans. And we actually have a, we, we do, if we take a world championships, for instance, we took our world championships for race walk mm -hmm. to Oman this year. Right. And John, myself and our teams uh, were spent one full morning pretty much cleaning a beach. Gosh. What did you find? Uh, you'd be amazed what we found. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably not going to identify what we found because I think we're probably still all on the cusp of, of having lunch. But I'll, I'll, happily, I'll t happily tell you afterwards. But it was extraordinary what we did actually find. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's just practical policies. If we take a world championships to a coastline, we will do... You know, we will work with... A, we work with a local charity. It was actually a charity that identified rare turtles mm -hmm. um, and the, the risk that they are in, under for, you know, from plastics and, you know, the usual degradation of, of beaches. But when it came to our clean air uh, um, initiative, it was, it was pretty sobering to recognise that 7 million people a year die from respiratory diseases, mm. that 99% of the population at some stage or another 
um, is going to be subject to air quality that falls well below any international standard. I, I feel particularly strongly about this. was one of my daughters is a chronic asthmatic. Right. There are days where she simply it cannot go into London to work. Um, and we just did, we recognised that we could actually make a contribution here. It was a relevant contribution. I think the really important thing is to, to find areas where you can make a difference and you have credibility to talk about. And there's no point in me going on talking about things that plenty of people are far better qualified than me to talk about. But I can say, for instance, that if you're running a marathon, and for sake of argument, you say that the average marathon time for somebody doing a, you know, in the middle, the, the median time is around about four and something hours, then they are shifting more oxygen and air through their respiratory systems in the space of that time than the average sedentary person is doing in between 48 and 72 hours. So even small levels of particulate getting into soft tissues in the lungs or the alveoli in, in, in the heart can cause catastrophic damage going forward. So having our air quality monitoring units in some of our big iconic venues where we're able to say to athletes that are competing and training at an elite level, there are safer times of the day and there are times of the day to avoid. We can give that same information, for instance, to our participating athletes and runners in those communities. And we also, if you go to any of our road competitions now, you will find members of our medical health and science team out there on their bikes with the air quality monitoring unit on, on the crossbars, picking up this information and, and feeding it into a broader, uh, into a broader community. So it, it's, we felt a responsibility because it, we can't have it both ways. If we are a sport saying that it is better uh, that we are best placed of any sport to help communities improve their immune systems, particularly off the back of pandemic, then we don't want to be replacing one set of pathologies <laughs> with another set of pathologies. We don't want everybody to be, you know, to have strong heart and lungs and cardio um, stimuli, and then in the same breath be saying to them, well, actually, we're asking you to go out and run in environments where it's not safe. So. That was, that was really the thinking, and we have the Declaration for Clean Air. I, did, I actually was on Fox Weather Channel at 11 o'clock last night while all of you were sitting finishing off glasses of champagne at the Heritage Night. I was on Fox Weather Channel. I'm not sure about the viewing figures. I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to change my life, and I don't feel a, a golden globe coming on, but it, it is important that we grab all these opportunities to to explain in sport what we're doing. And sustainability for me is not also just about climate change. It is about diversity and inclusion. It is about how you design facilities. And you know, just to finish on one point, um, you know, I, I'm quite close to the Formula One motor racing world. It's really interesting. Everybody assumes that actually there is one problem which doesn't really exist. Only 0.6% of wow. the issue comes out of the back of an exhaust pipe at a Grand Prix. The other 99-something percent is about energy and food and how you get the cars there and, you know, all the issues around sustainability and plastic containers. It's, 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 a, standard, it's a standard issue. So, actually, sport can shine a light but has to be honest about its own footprint mm -hmm. and that it's not in such ob obvious or observable areas. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting. You talk about marathon runners and <clears throat> seeing like your, your key stakeholders being disproportionately impacted by environment makes it obviously a, yeah. a, a core issue for you rather than something something quite peripheral. Yeah. Uh, Christoph, um, tell us a little bit about how you kind of make sustainability, how, how you how you go through it in, in practical terms, how you foster a culture of sustainability at Brad Class of Zurich, um, how do you plan things, how do you execute <coughs> your, your your strategies? Actually, it was already 14 years ago when we did our first analysis in 2008. I made the whole ecological analysis about the carbon footprint of El Clase Zurich, and then we decided to, to reduce what we can reduce or compensate. So we were the first big event in Switzerland who did it. 
was a little bit ahead of time yeah, because I went years, to yeah. the city of Zurich, the Canton, how we can improve and what they think about, and they couldn't answer this answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, but now it's a, uh, it's a, but so we, we are used to do it, and the majority is coming from flights right. by the athletes. And as you said, it's not the obvious one. Sometimes things around that we have to think <laughs> about uh, how we fly around if if is compensating the right thing and how we can and um, this was a really an eye-opening process if you do the just the proper analysis about as you said your own event what you in which areas you have an influence yeah. and but then we decided since uh, 2009 this one is CO2 neutral well across the Zurich I know how people are traveling we included then uh, the public transportation ticket so you can freely open it. Mm -hmm. We banned the official parking places. We make it difficult to come by car on purpose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just to mot motivate, use public transportation, just send out the signal. And also last year we changed the hospitality concept, just food and beverages from an area of our, around 80 kilometers. So 10 years ago, we, the meat came from Argentina, <laughs> and the Kiwis from New Zealand, and we thought, well, probably this is not the proper approach. We want to be a role model also for others, and you have to start to change the processes. In between, we had kind of other priorities. We were had priorities on the social sustainability with the UBS Kids Cup. We, we did kind of the European Championships. We, we have a partnership now with uh, Special Olympics. We include with them. But now we thought we have to do a relaunch. And that's where we partner up with World Athletics and also <coughs> Oslo is doing a great job. And we have to join forces because yesterday evening at the Heritage evening, I talked about off time. My off time is I going up in the mountains. I like mm. Zurich, kind of this pressure. But when you're up in the mountains, you see climate change. I mean, you cannot ski anymore as you did it five years ago. The glaciers are disappearing and not a couple of meters or yards. It's 1K mm -hmm. per year. Uh, and the rocks, are, I like to climb it. The rocks are falling. It's getting dangerous kind of routes. And it's going so fast at the moment. And I came one day back. We cannot wait and just talk. We have to do something. We have to speed up. And this kind of the motivation we had at Well Class of Zurich, what we can do for the ecological part, where we can mm -hmm. contribute. And I think this is a very difficult, uh, important discussion. But for me, what counts are the measures, not the talks, the measures. And this will be the next step, how we, we can join forces to me really contribute. So in, in, in a sporting context, um, obviously very far ahead of many other sports. You've been measuring your environmental footprint for 14 years now, which I think is pretty unheard of for, for, for many sports. O obviously now there's, there's pressure on organizations to become more sustainable, but there, there probably wasn't that much pressure around that time. So, so what, what originally motivated you to, to start looking at your ecolog ecological footprint 14 years ago? Why, was it, why did it become a priority then? It was al already a topic then. And I think for the future, it's an important topic. It was, at that time, of course, there were negative voices. Yeah, it's not scientifically proved and this and that. But I have a scientific background. <laughs> my, my father is a physicist and uh, or I have a close relation to the university here. And for me, it was clear, this is direction. And often, it's the curve is like this. It goes slowing, and suddenly, it mm. explodes. Yeah. And that. Th this is the problem, that is the, this delay effect, and suddenly that's why you don't change anything, and then to wait till it's a little bit too late or <coughs> to change, we thought we have to anticipate it, we are clever, but it's super hard because there is not, as you're right, there was not enough pressure that we also, we lost a little bit our focus and we want to pick it up again. I don't, what, what role do athletes have in promoting sustainability through sport? Um, yeah, I think that uh, having a platform as an athlete is is key to promote sustainability. I think everyone saw the Paris Saint-Germain um, press conference uh, the other day where this was also a topic and uh, 
the, the athlete Mbappé was uh, was laughing at uh, at the, the proposition. Why wouldn't you rather uh, travel with the train instead of private jets to go to your to your games? And this is not just to point out. It's not to point out the reaction of the athlete in uh, that, that we're talking about. It's about also, um, yeah, being aware that we need to have this education as athletes to be able to make a positive impact. Mbappé has, I guess, millions of followers, and kids are going to see what he did and see his reaction and think that it's normal. But it is not normal because, as, as we said, um, I was in, in Lausanne. We were in Lausanne two weeks ago for the Diamond League, and I was speaking that the Glacier 3000, which is uh, the Diableret, is predicted to disappear completely by 2030. Mm -hmm. And this is in eight years. It's not in the... It's in the foreseeable future. It's not something that it's we can almost touch. And um, I think as athletes, we have the responsibility to educate ourselves and to use our our platform to educate others. And um, we we were not taught this in school, but it's something that we can speak about and uh, and just raise awareness. But before we continue, does, does everyone has everyone seen that footage? Does anyone not of the f if not? So there was a, a footballer, a very famous footballer, Kylian Mbappe, he plays in France. He'll probably be the best player in the world in a few years' time. He's very, very talented. And he was asked in a press conference. <laughs> <laughs> it's a matter of opinion. It's a matter of opinion. <laughs> but he's, he's at a press conference, and the journalist, uh, the, the team took a, a, a plane instead of a train, which could have taken two hours. And the journalist asked, is, is this a responsible thing to do? with climate change. And he started laughing and his coach made quite a silly comment and he's being criticized quite heavily because of these comments. Um, but, you know, what is that level of responsibility? So obviously he's the public face of this very big faux pas. Mm -hmm. um, but who is it, who's responsible for kind of guiding him around that? Mm -hmm. uh, because he's the one that's going to get lots of criticism, but obviously mm -hmm. his club or his coach or his entourage haven't haven't educated him about this. Mm -hmm. So, so how, how could he be better supported next time he's asked a question like that? Because I think that what I understood also, Paris Saint-Germain wants to make improvement in this, in this direction. So, of course, it's also the club's responsibility, I think, in this case, to, if you want to make improvement, um, give some kind of sensibility to your and education to your, to your players um, and how all together we can do this. It's not just the club that has to be to, to make an impact. It also has to come from, from the players. <laughs> and, um, and I think it's really for, for everyone. And um, it's, it, life has, is a big school, <laughs> if we want to say <laughs> it like this. We, we, we're not born um, with all the knowledge that we need. So it's for sure not his own fault. He's not been educated, but we can help him in this way by doing a workshop with the players or just trying to do something in this way. To be able, before we move on to talk about some of your research, I'd, I'd like to get your opinion on that, Seb, about athlete and where that where athlete responsibility starts and ends in this conversation and how you know organizations like World Athletics clubs can support athletes to communicate on these you topics. Know, there's, no, there's not really very much I would add to the, the, the comments mm. because I, I think we make a fundamental mistake in any organization. And I think we sit there thinking, well, we're in sport or a political party or a charity or a high tech business. And you sort of get cocooned in that world. Mm. And young people don't look at that like that anymore. <clears throat> they don't look at us as a, you know, international sports federation. They ask actually a very much more fundamental question. And I'm not even sure on most occasions, it's it may be it may be um, a it may be an accurate reflection. It may be a subliminal observation. But they're asking themselves fundamentally a really important question, and that is when they look at us here today, they look at us and go, "Do they reflect the world I live in?" And if they don't, and if we don't then the reality of it is they'll move on to something that is that does and for me the issue is that young people and i don't put myself in that category remotely are sitting at all the big 
crossroads of all the big moral hotspots mm -hmm. in a way that my generation didn't and my parents didn't. They're very much more attuned to... So many of them would have been shocked by the response of Mbappe. Mm -hmm. Not because they don't rate him as a footballer, but they would just think, it doesn't reflect the world I live in. Yeah. And I think we need to be having, we need to not just to be saying something, but we need to show that we are able to break out of our sports silo and be sitting at the table making a, a contribution. So, look, 75%, <clears throat> we did some, some survey work not that long ago, actually in the lead up to COP26. And Bob, you'll probably correct me, but I'm digging deep now. But I think 75% of the athletes said that we needed to do something, we needed to do it now, and there was no time to waste. 70% of that group said that climate change had impacted them in their training, in their lifestyles, and certainly in their competitions and their choice of competitions. And I think 90%, 90% said that there were no tomorrows here, mm. that we did have to, have to do something. So, you know, that's a pretty clear steer to the leadership of any sport, whether you understand it or not, to actually make sure that you do understand it and you are putting practical applications in place. And, and I think Christoph is absolutely right. You know, we can only do what we can do but I do genuinely think the video that we produced for COP26, I don't know whether you saw it, it was 26, 26 of our Olympic uh, medalists, world record holders. That was powerful. That had, that was a, that had a massive impact uh, at COP26. So I think athletes, the, the advocacy from athletes that can be helped in some cases to understand the challenge and I think the second, sorry to go on a bit here, but the second issue that we are going to have to confront whether we like it or not is I cannot see how, going forward, we are going to be able to maintain many of our endurance events, and particularly our road events, in world championships at a time where we classically stage our world championships. Mm -hmm. We were in Eugene, Oregon, not this year, but last year for the Olympic trials. John, you were there. The temperature got to 44 degrees in one of the, in, in, in one of the most equitable, equitable um, uh, climates on the Northwest Pacific. They actually had to move the 10,000 meters. Um, if we'd been in Paris for the Olympic Games this year, that was 44 something degrees. So this is with us and we're going to have to be very much we're going to have to be very much more flexible around calendars and how and where we stage our events. We were in Sapporo because it was deemed Tokyo was going to be too hot. Roadside in Sapporo, it was still 41 degrees mm -hmm. yeah. at one point. So, you know, it's, th this is a challenge that we have to rise to. Uh, Tabidia, what is your research telling us about how sport is rising to sustainability? What is sport's general approach? Uh, yeah. Regarding sustainability and regarding what uh, the previous speaker has saying uh, uh, just now, I, I would say that uh, I would look at sport uh, uh, as a, a sector that needs uh, an holistic approach uh, to our environmental sustainability. Uh, climate change is a big challenge and is, it's a big issue. And uh, the president before said, uh, uh, okay, sustainability is not climate change. Uh, is not only climate change, but is all uh, social inclusion and so on. And uh, I fully agree naturally with this agreement. But I would say environmental sustainability in sport is not only climate change, but is also uh, other kind of, um, of environmental impact. For example, the president before was speaking about air pollution that could affect uh, uh, the, the athletes uh, in, uh, in the athletics. So the air pollution coming from particulate pollution is not part of climate change. So surely uh, sport should look at environmental sustainability uh, with an holistic approach. Again, uh, sitting uh, uh, a research that we have carried out, the environmental footprint uh, 
that uh, I was mentioning before. We have done this environmental footprint uh, in a football match, in specific uh, a football match of uh, Real Betis, that is uh, a professional team uh, in Spanish Liga based in Sevilla, that uh, has been involved in our of, of, on, on, in one of our projects uh, that we have carried out uh, two years ago. We have calculated according to all the data uh, of real betis from food and beverage, from mobility, from uh, mobility of supporter, of talent scout, and so on, from uh, the quantity of chemicals they use uh, to manage the pitch, uh, uh, and so on. We have calculated the overall environmental footprint. What means environmental footprint? It means uh, we have calculated 16 different impact categories. And one of these impact categories was carbon footprint, so the impact on climate change. Carbon footprint has resulted the main important impact category. Uh, and it is due, as Christophe was saying, uh, with uh, especially flight, uh, uh, flight uh, mobility. Think to the flight mobility of supporter for international match. Uh, Real Betis in that year, we did this footprint in the season 2018-2019 to avoid COVID impact. In the season played Europa League, so they host uh, some matches, uh, international matches, so they host uh, some international supporters that use flight. But uh, uh, according to this result, the impact category of carbon footprint accounts uh, for 31% of the overall environmental footprint. The other 15 impact category account for 69. So I, uh, uh, I, I will say, if you look, uh, if uh, Real Bet is uh, According to this study, we look only to climate change and carbon footprint. We'll work on the improvement of 31% of its impact. And uh, forgetting the 69% that can be linked to other impact uh, like uh, water footprint, like uh, uh, the, uh, the air pollution uh, uh, and so the air emission, or think to the noise, uh, or think to the waste management, even if naturally waste management or chemical consumption in somehow can be associated uh, to uh, a climate uh, impact, uh, impact too. So uh, I would say uh, environmental sustainability in sport, again, is not only climate change, even if climate change and carbon footprint uh, is one of the most important impact, according to our results. Well, well in, in that 69%, what, what else was high? So, so climate change was 31%. What, what else does sport need to pay attention to in this? Uh, the, the, the other, uh, for example, water footprint. Okay, Sevilla is uh, in south of uh, of, uh, of Europe, so probably water footprint is not an issue in Zurich or I don't know in Norway for for professional team uh, or matches uh, uh, in uh, there. Or uh, if I remember well, eutrophication. Eutrophication is an impact that derives from uh, water discharge, uh, use of chemicals that after the rain they go uh, in the river and uh, provoke eutrophication. Uh, in the uh, sweet uh, water or also in the sea. So there are several and different, and different uh, impact. But I was saying uh, carbon footprint, uh, how huge it was. We have calculated some equivalence in order to better understand. So the carbon footprint of, real, of one match of real Betis was equivalent to 40, the emission of a car that uh, do 41 times the street distance between Rome and Hong Kong. So it, it, it's for, for Hong Kong. 41 times an average car, not a truck, an average car. So before I was saying, uh, is uh, important the environmental impact of sport? In that case, yes, because 40, 41, 41 times the street distance between Rome and Hong Kong with a car is not uh, a low quantity of emission. In specific, it was uh, 71 uh, tons of CO2 equi equivalent, uh, uh, the carbon footprint of, of the match. Or we have done another equivalence with uh, how many trees you need to absorb the CO2 equivalent emitted by a football match. And the results, if I'm not wrong, it was uh, one year, in one year, you need uh, 2,400 trees. So a quite big forest. Uh, to offset uh, the CO2 emission of so one, one football match. match. One match. And in that season, Real Betis play 27 matches. So you have to multiply it if you want the impact, uh, the impact for one year. It's a big forest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and this and this kind uh, of study naturally we would like uh, very much uh, to repeat uh, in uh, also in athletics or in other sport because are important uh, to better understand uh, the real impact uh, and to better understand uh, the activities that are the main target the main uh, areas to target to reduce uh, the environmental impact Sh yeah go yeah. ahead um, did did the study that you did do for this club did they change something afterwards, or was it something that you just took as an example? <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, that's the most yeah. important question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, usually we do the study as an analysis yeah. to identify priority priority in this kind of project, and then to go back to the sport organization saying, okay, these are the results. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, put uh, uh, let's discuss on a table uh, what we can do to improve. It's clear that. Uh, if uh, the flights are the highest uh, uh, impact activity, you have to take into account also the capacity to influence a certain mm -hmm. impact. What you can do uh, with the uh, away supporter that come uh, from uh, United Kingdom to mm -hmm. see an Europa League match, you can do s you cannot do so much. Mm -hmm. But there are other impacts like. Uh, energy consumption for lighting in the match uh, where you have a strong influence because uh, that that is an environmental aspect that you originate directly with the, with the, with the stadium that is in your ownership uh, often so in that case energy consumption was very uh, important for carbon footprint the start to discuss uh, to understand uh, to put uh, LED lights uh, or, or to adopt some technologies that can reduce uh, uh, this impact but uh, sure this analysis is good if then you have a follow-up uh, with the organization to try to improve. So, so we talk about the impact of flights, changing LED lights. I think lots of people in sport will maybe see sustainability as a cost rather than an investment. But Christoph, maybe we can ask you the question. How, how can we reposition uh, environmental sustainability as an investment rather than a cost so more sports pick it up? Yeah, that's the way we think about this one. And an important point, Seb, you mentioned about the younger generation. They rate you as an organization or event if you're relevant to them or not. And I think if you don't respond and position you in the right direction, suddenly, out of the blue, you are irrelevant and you are dead. And there is really st a str in the younger generation this is key because it's their future. And sometimes they're worried about the kind of these old men uh, making the decisions uh, which are disconnected from their reality. Exactly, we experienced the same thing. Mm -hmm. And this is one just from a risk prevention for, you, uh, pr prevention for yourself. But at the same time, when you look at the financial flows where the big companies are investing their money, there is a huge shift. It has to make sense for the same reason you, you mentioned with the younger generation. And if you want to be relevant also for your sponsors, mm. um, you, ha you have to position you as well and contribute, even if the ecologic, uh, for the sustainability in an e ecological way or as a uh, social sustainability. For us, uh, here we have also two reps from UBS. And UBS is, for me, a role model globally in the financial sector, how they rate now every investment. Uh, no, normal investments, nothing to do with sponsorship, but also at the same time sponsorship. And there's the first events they cannot find sponsors anymore because they do not think ahead. And just if you do it right, it's also an opportunity to get more sponsor and uh, develop the sport at the same time. I was at the event last night. People having a great time, really enjoyed it. Were they influenced by the sustainability credentials of the event? Is that is that feeding into? Because you talk about young fans. Are young fans coming to events, or will, or, or will they stop going to events because of the sustainability credentials? They'll just, they'll still come, right? Because it's great entertainment. Does that have any bearing on their the decisions? Maybe you can both come in on this one. It was your event. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good question. Of course, we we go out to to attract new audience. I, I think you need both. You have to be more, present the sport in a really entertaining way, but then you get the cross check. What do you do? Uh, what are the impact? Not just it, it's pure entertainment, you need a deeper reason. And 
in the future, we want to be super transparent also on our website. We're going to have an advisory board. Just what we, we, we present it to the world, where are we at the moment, ecologically, so, uh, for the social impact and the economic impact, where we want to be, and what is the strategy there. And I think this is an important one to be honest, uh, transparent, and I blame many organizations of greenwashing. They just yeah. think they do it, yeah. but when you dig in, it's nothing, to be honest. And I think that's the way this, this honesty, transparency, otherwise it goes super fast with these digital channels. You're that in within a couple hours. <laughs> It's, well, an un it's an uncomfortable morning for Shell and ExxonMobil <laughs> because I don't know whether you saw that, but they, they've got the F list. They're topping the F list, mm -hmm. the failed list of, of, of corporates out there in terms of the gap between what they're saying and what they're and actually what they're spending. and what they're spending yeah. and investing. And I think Shell were um, Shell and Exxon were one and two, and you know um, other companies. You know, there, there's and. We need to make sure we're not on that list uh, <laughs> in, in terms of sport. No, it's really important. Um, and look, it's an interesting walk down memory lane for me, this argument about what's a cost and what's an investment, because I was beset by that for effectively 10 years in London around the Olympic Games, because the dullards in the media would just suddenly take the operational budget and the infrastructural budget, throw it all together. So it didn't really matter whether you were making a London tube station more accessible for people with disability and impairment. That suddenly became a cost of the games. Mm. But nor should we hide from the fact that what we need to do is going to cost. I mean, it, it, the biggest challenge I think we face at the moment is the escalating energy bills, and I'm not going to go into the politics of that, some of it is domestically created, others, uh, there are externalities that you know, are, are only too obvious. But the, the real problem going forward is that I've already heard politicians sort of backing off the 2030, 2040, 2050 uh, ambitions. They're already talking about maybe exploring more oil fields and fossil fuels again you know they're talking about you know nuclear energy you know nobody is talking as much as they should be about green hydrogen by the way so there are things that we could be doing but i think the real challenge for the next year or so is whether politicians are going to <laughs> start coming back down the mountain from some of the lofty observations because of the current challenge uh, around energy prices uh, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't pretend that some of these remedies are going to be cost-free. They're not. I would always argue that you're investing in children and grandchildren and providing a, a, a sustainable environment for them. But, you know, we're coming from a long way back, and this is going to cost, and it has to be built in to economic modelling. Ida, what do you think about the whole kind of conversation about, about greenwashing we, we spoke about obviously mm -hmm. there's lots of flying sport we talk about mm -hmm. the perception of athletes like Kylian Mbappe speaking about climate change in, in this way how, how can sport safeguard itself from greenwashing what, what can it do to be transparent so people can see what it's trying to do in quite an authentic way yeah I think what Christoph said is uh, is the the best example for me trying to be transparent and then showing these are our goals this is how we're meeting them and showing results and how it's done and um, this is how everyone can also have faith in the process and um, see that there's no greenwashing there's no intentions of sh showing something but just gaining money out of it and um, yeah, I think that for us athletes seeing this example, it's something that uh, it's encouraging us to, for example, keep going to a certain competition or n and not doubting maybe I don't want to fly to that competition because I'm not sure how things are done there. Do you, do you feel that way sometimes? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And sorry if I have to say it, but <laughs> <laughs> I, when, when I discovered how it was going to be in Doha in 2019, I was not sure that for me, how I always presented myself, uh, and in wanting to make a change, in wanting to uh, 
um, yeah, also how I spoke with my friends, saying, yes, I'm going to run in a stadium that it's uh, being cooled down, mm. and uh, this has a cost environmentally. And uh, it, I, at some point I had to choose, I have to do my job, but it's not really in, in line to what I'm trying to achieve, uh, achieve as a human being. So it's, it's this game that we are now faced to play, and it's, it's sometimes hard to decide what is the best for, for me, because of course we're also um, representing sponsors, we're representing ourselves as a person at the same time. Yeah. I mean, it's a difficult point. I mean, how do you make that choice? Because yeah. there are so many things to, to consider, so many different <laughs> nuanced things to, to look at. How, you know, how do you make that choice between, I'm going to do this, I'm going to go and continue, I'm going to go and do my job, or mm -hmm. there's, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not doing this. Where, where, do you, where do you draw the line as an athlete? Yeah, that's a hard question, <laughs> because in the end I went to Doha, so <laughs> that's, that's a bit the thing. And um, we also have to, I think, for me in Doha, I was still young and I was there with the relay. In the end, I could also participate in the 100 meter because they, could, they had to fill up the, um, the list. But uh, this was an opportunity for me to grow as an athlete. But now that hopefully when I establish myself more, then I'm able to make these decisions and maybe also to set an example. Look, this is what I, I'm, I'm able to do. Maybe I'm going to res race a little bit more. If I can, I'm going to go there by train or find solutions. But of course, everyone's situation is different. And um, has, ha we have to adapt as athletes to, to this as well. Do we, do we have any questions? Because we are coming up to time. Do we have any questions from the audience? But before that, a very another quick question. Mm -hmm. I, um, and I think when we talk about topics like sustainability and other social or environmental, people encourage athletes to use their voice and use their platform. Mm -hmm. But is there any other way that athletes can get involved? For, from a governance point of view, would you like to be helping making the policies? And how can, how can you be supported to, 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 be in, to be put in that position? Yeah, I think that uh, if s the politicians also and the, the entities are, are willing to listen to our voice, I think it has to, that everyone has to be open. It cannot only come one way. And uh, we, we have, have to be open-minded. Of course, I studied history and literature, literature at, at the university, so I'm not specialized in, in this field, but I, I want to try to make a difference. And if I'm accompanied by um, the right group of people that is, has information that we, we're, we're lucky today, we're, like I am learning things sitting here, and uh, if we can do this uh, as a conversation and where everyone is open-minded and listening, it's uh, it's for sure going to make a difference. Tiberio, greenwashing. How can sports? How can sport avoid? Yeah. Avoid it. Uh, as uh, as she was saying, uh, uh, greenwashing is due to untransparent and uh, not properly uh, external communication. So, it can be associated to m two main aspects. When uh, a sport organization uh, publishes some claims that are not true. So the question is how I can do a sport organization to demonstrate uh, that uh, what I'm saying, uh, for example, my carbon emission of uh, Diamond League is this amount uh, and uh, that uh, this, uh, this statement is true. Uh, with uh, with uh, uh, the main approach is uh, to use technical and scientifically uh, standard to calculate and so be transparent on which are the methods that you are using and that uh, the fact that you are using uh, the most important international standard. And if possible, after this calculation, before the claim, before the communication, obtain a third party certification that uh, in somehow certify that is true. The calculation done is true. The emission done is true. And so if you decide to offset, as we were discussing the day before yesterday in a workshop with other athletes, if you decide to offset this amount of uh, CO2 emission, you can declare outside that you are carbon neutral uh, event because you have completely offset, uh, offset uh, the, uh, the emission. The other, the other risk for greenwashing is that uh, the claims are vague because you are not clear in what you are saying. Again, here, this is, a, let's say, a less... Uh, 
a less important scene of, of greenwashing somehow. Uh, also in this case, uh, there are some uh, uh, international ISO, ISO standard that uh, help the organization uh, to do some check on the claims that you are going to publish uh, in order to verify if uh, the vagueness uh, of this claim uh, are in somehow at risk of greenwashing. Before we finish up, two short final questions for each of our panel. Um, what's next for you in terms of trying to use your respective organizations or, or your platforms to boost sustainability through sport? And what's your call to action for the rest of the industry? Maybe, Christoph, we can, we can start with you. Yeah, call to action is for me to network, to do it together, not in isolation, that you learn from each other, get the inspiration. Uh, that's why I, I'll, I like this panel, or also with UBS, really challenging. But this is how you grow. And for us at Velcos Zurich, we had we just published our plans for the next uh, six years till 2028, uh, when Velcos Zurich will be 100 years old. And then we want we want to be a role model in the world in the in the, uh, in the world of athletics. And we till 28, we're gonna be uh, net zero emissions for all year round. What we are oh, doing. 28. 28. Yeah, sorry. Um, because we have also, also the UBS Kids Cup, more than 1,000 events, we include them. And in four years, was a good example you, you mentioned, with the trees, you really see how to offset things. If you have to offset, I want to offset it in Switzerland. You, so you're going to see this forest. <laughs> Maybe do that <laughs> next. Uh, or w there, that you can prove it. At the moment, we are what we cannot reduce, mm -hmm. we pay. But I have no clue if this... Yeah where this money is going. And this is kind of makes me a bit nervous because it's a lot of money. We already paid over the years, probably almost a million in projects. I have no clue if this money arrived. So I want to see it yeah. and use it as an example to educate or a combination with the US Kids Cup, the younger generation. That's what we do. That's where our emissions, otherwise we sh you shouldn't do an event, then it's, you have no emissions, but it's not the goal. And I think these are the approaches. And of course, in the social areas, we will focus even more on women, young women, bring them into the management. Often they are too shy in comparison, or not to have the same, same confidence than men. And we have a mentoring program if they want to have a career in sport, in sports management. Seb? The future plans call to action. <coughs> well, the, the, next month we're going to announce the, uh, an initiative called Better World Ambassadors. There'll be 10 or 12 of them, uh, and they're going to be high-profile competitors, um, maybe past competitors as well. Um, and they will be make themselves available for awareness campaigns, uh, the opportunity to raise their concerns and sit with us or with meeting directors that are wanting some guidance and some help in this space. Uh, there'll be 10 or 12 of them. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll be across all our continental, what we call our area associations, all our continents. So uh, they, there will be a, a broad uh, representation. And that, that, we feel, again, is important because... What we do try to do all the time at World Athletics is basically drive the sport forward with the advocacy and the high profile voices that athletes can bring to this. And believe me, you know, we we don't have too we don't actually have too many Mbappes in our sport. You know, our, our sport really does get this. Um, and the challenge going forward, um, and, and again you summed it up perfectly, there is a challenge. You know, when do we decide, you know, where is an appropriate place to take our sport to? And that's not just around climate change. That's going to be around human rights. It's going to be much more broadly across the ESG uh, platform. Uh, and how do we make sure that in our own evaluation process for cities, which we now have, and it's a much more formulaic and tighter set of metrics, that we have things in there around clean air and not putting athletes into environments where they're going to be compromising their own beliefs about climate change, or worse than that, we're putting them into an injurious mm. environment where you know we have a responsibility to make sure that 
long after they've retired, we haven't put them into environments where they're going to be having long-term implications from the choices of venues that we, we make. And that's going to be tough because there are some cities at this moment, if we, you know, walk the walk, will not be staging championships. Isla, what's next for you and what will be your call to action to people in the industry? I started trying to educate my parents to separate <laughs> waste. <laughs> and I think <laughs> I'm going to try to follow this path and trying to do it on a, uh, with a bigger audience. I mean, they're doing it now. <laughs> they're separating waste. So I did have an impact on that. And I think that ev all of us have this, this impact that can be made only on a family basis. And now with my followers on Instagram, for example, or Facebook, this is already something that if I try to send a message a little bit by the some st uh, one step after the other, s this message is going to land somewhere. So this mm. is for sure something that I'm going to try to pursue. Tiberio. As, uh, as Christopher would say, mm, networking surely as academic is important for us because uh, we have a lot of, to learn uh, from you, from sport organization, from athletes about sport. At the same time, we can bring our approaches and method that, uh, that we have applied also in, in other sector. And uh, this is also the reason because uh, today uh, I'm here with a colleague uh, and also with Matthew because uh, in June we have started uh, an Erasmus uh, project. It is a project funded by Erasmus uh, program in Europe uh, that, is came, uh, that is called uh, Games. Uh, where World Athletics uh, is one of the partners. Other partners are International Federation of Biathlon and uh, Floorball, other two sports. The objective of this project uh, is uh, what we have discussed today. So try to understand uh, what are the key impacts, uh, try to understand what are the best practice to be implemented to improve uh, uh, the environmental impact uh, of the event uh, managed by the, these uh, three sports, and then uh, implement it. Probably we will be here again in the future, we hope, because the project has started in June and we land after uh, 30 months. So we will have the opportunity to talk again uh, with uh, Christoph, President, and, and Matthew is also uh, involved in the project with uh, his uh, communication agency uh, as a dissemination partner. Thanks for giving that a plug. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a really, really nice panel. Um, please uh, join me in thanking Christoph Yoho, Sebko Ali Del Ponte, and Timiro Dadi for giving us such a, a great panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>